Sorry, it's working. It's working now. Uh, can I proceed? Yeah, yeah, you can start. Yeah. So very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, we've been waiting for this session uh, for the last three days. So it's my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Andre Gaim uh, uh, for the session. So Dr. Andre Gaim is currently the professor at the University of Manchester, and he was awarded the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics for his experiments with graphene. He is Regis Professor of Physics and Royal Society Research Professor at the National Graphene Institute. Awarded, he was awarded honorary doctorates from Delft University of Technology, ETH Zurich, the University of Antwerp, and the University of Manchester. In 2010, Gim was appointed as Knight Commander of the Order of the Netherlands Lion for his contribution to Dutch science. In 2011, Gim became a corresponding member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science. He is Honorary Professor of Moscow Phys Tech, Honorary Professor of the University of uh, Jimigan, Honorary Fellow of the Institute of Physics, Honorary Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, Honorary Fellow of the Singapore Institute of Physics, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He has published many research papers, of which more than 20 are cited over 1,000 times and 4 are cited over 10,000 times. Thomson Reuters has repeatedly named him among the world's most active scientists and attributes to him the initiation of three new research friends, diamagnetic alleviation, gecko tape, and graphene. Andre was also awarded the Ig Nobel Prize in 2000 for his work on levitating frogs, becoming the only recipient of Nobel and Ig Nobel Prizes. So it's a uh, honor and pleasure to have you here, Dr. Andre. And uh, he'll be talking on 2D empty space and its unusual properties. So with this, I welcome Dr. Andre and uh, I'm handing over the session to Dr. Andre to start his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Andre. Uh, thank you very much. It's a little bit outdated uh, CD, actually, probably a few years old. Uh, uh, do you see my screen? Uh, yeah, it's coming out. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Uh, some, I, I see that there are about 250 participants. Thank you, everyone, uh, joining. I will be talking. Uh, could you please mute your microphones because uh, it's rather irritating to, uh, to hear background noises. What I'm going to do is not about the Nobel Prize winning work, but something which uh, we have... Uh, uh, been doing over the last, uh, let's say, three, four years. It's a new subject. Uh, we, we started uh, quite recently. And uh, um, I hope you will enjoy how interesting science is behind. Let me start uh, with the uh, with, uh, uh, usual suspect, with graphene. Everyone knows graphene, and we all know how to make graphene. In most cases, you take a chunk of graphite and extract a single atomic plane. You kind of uh, uh, study uh, what's going on 
with this atomic plane of carbon, uh, graphene, and normally people forget about the rest, uh, throw away the rest. Uh, you can change a little bit mentality and uh, ask yourself a different question. If we forget about graphene, what is left behind? And you can imagine after you extracted a single atomic plane, what would be there? A dislocation, or actually a couple of dislocation connected by, a, by an empty space. So what we were trying to do over this uh, last four years is to study properties of this empty space. Uh, obviously, it's not that easy to extract atomic flame from the crystal. Nowadays, graphene is easy to obtain, but make an empty space it seems to be a sci-fi uh, uh, project. Uh, and it looked like science fiction a few years ago. But nowadays, we know how to make Van der Waals assemblies of different crystals by putting graphene-like uh, crystals on top of each other uh, in whatever combination it is. This is uh, one of the probably most hot subjects in the world, uh, using Van der Waals assembly to make all sorts of different structures. So what we have done to make this empty state a little bit different way. Instead of making a whole plane there, we put a, a spaces in between. Those regions are spaces. And uh, if we put spaces and do the same assembly, obviously there would be an empty space behind. And this is not only kind of cartoon, this is the real cross section of uh, graphite crystals from which by using this assembly, putting spacer here and putting spacer here, we make this kind of uh, uh, two edge dislocations connected by an empty space. This is the smallest uh, space we could create and uh, see it in a microscope, you will later see that we can also extract a single graphene layer, but as images are concerned, two graphene layers extracted, 6.7 angstrom empty space is the smallest we can do. If we can do this small, we can make bigger uh, capillaries, bigger channels uh, by putting thicker space, a spore layer in this case, and uh, whatever, 40 layers, whatever we want, uh, we can make uh, in this kind of manner. So important that it's not only angstrom scale technology, for the first time we approach this limit by top-down approach, but also the walls here are atomically flat. So we are, to, we are talking about technology with angstrom scale accuracy here. If you want to measure something, it's not just, it's not enough just make a picture in transmission electron micros, a microscope. You need to assemble uh, this assembly onto something where you can measure properties. And because we are talking about uh, atomic and molecular transport through these assemblies, uh, you need to arrange. And uh, it's in a proper design. And design is the major problem. Making TM pictures, <coughs> it's not, <coughs> sorry, uh, not coronavirus. Um, uh, to make transmission electron microscope pictures, it's not uh, a big deal, but uh, to, to make an assembly for measurements, it's really hard. So we start with silicon nitride wafer. 
then we put one uh, piece of graphite, a bottom layer. Then we put, <coughs> sorry, again, those spaces and then the edge. And on top, we put an, another piece of graphite or another two dimensional crystal. So here is our capillaries. And now those capillaries allow to study transport or whatever it is from here into here. Everything else is assembled on a silicon wafer. Uh, one container is above, one container is below, and we study transport through one or many capillaries which are assembled in this way. So this is how it looks like in reality. This is a silicon wafer. You see this white spot? This is a, a, a silicon nitride membrane. Uh, if you zoom in, this is silicon nitride membrane seen in, in green here. And this is our assembly of three crystals. If you zoom even further, there is a hole which is leads to one container and those are channels which are not covered by the top layer uh, here, but they are vaguely seen uh, under the top graphite layer here. And we study how molecules and, and atoms, how liquids and gases flow from this container from hole leading to one container along those channel into another container. And we can make from one to thousand channels, whatever we want, not only their height, but their length, their width, and uh, their number we can control by this design. Before I go to the properties, I like to point out that there is a one major conceptual problem when you deal with uh, Van der Waals assembly. Because anyone who looked in graphene, for example, in transmission electron microscope, they know that graphene is, you know, this honeycomb lattice. It's nice to draw pictures, but if you look uh, in a microscope, even in ultra high vacuum, you'll find out that. Uh, it's covered, this monolayer is covered with hydrocarbons, with water, even in highest vacuum. Annealing doesn't help because all surfaces under ambient conditions, they absorb atoms, especially hydrocarbons. And it's very rarely you can see uh, clear patches where here you can see a carbon lattice. It's graphene here but mostly it's covered like that. So um, I actually thought that this project, which I gave uh, uh, five years ago to a uh, postdoc at that time, Radha Boya, uh, an Indian national uh, who started working with me, I actually thought that the project wouldn't work as well as it worked out. I thought something interesting would come out but didn't expect that it would be properly working. Fortunately, it worked better for a very simple reason, because when you put crystals on top to, of each other, they attract very strongly by Van der Waals interaction. Van der Waals interaction is considered very weak, but when you are talking about angstrom uh, distances, it's rather, power force, something like it can create pressures about uh, thousand uh, kilobars. Uh, so when you put two crystals on top of each other, this contamination doesn't like to leave there. It segregates into the pockets, which you see here. You put one crystal on top of each other and uh, all contaminations goes into those pockets and leaving a clean space. And you can make cross section and find out that there is no contamination left. In this case, it's cross sectional picture of graphene boron nitride super lattice. There are about 10 
by less graphene and 10 mono by less of, uh, of HBN here, and you don't see any contamination between. There is essentially perfect assembly. And this we have shown quite some time ago, but this is very important. When you do this Van der Waals assembly, your surfaces uh, are atomically clean and atomically flat. And but when we make those transport measurements, I'm going to discuss uh, discuss now. Uh, it's important to think about possible contamination. For example, here we like to study properties through this uh, uh, Angstrom scale one channel. To avoid its being blocked, we make contamination sinks. So when we make an assembly, all contamination goes somewhere else. So there is a high probability that this channel remains uh, remains uh, clean. Sometimes we do have blockage, uh, but uh, uh, nowadays with uh, all improvements, in most cases, we, we have clean transport channel. So let me switch now to the physics. Uh, we study using this uh, two-dimensional empty space. Logically, not historically how we did it, logically would be uh, most interesting to uh, and sim the simplest situation, how gases go through those capillaries. And helium is an obvious candidate, the least interacted case. So a couple of years ago, we make this assembly. One container is with uh, uh, helium, regulated pressure, and another container is vacuum. And there is a leak detector which allows to see how helium atoms, how quickly they go through those channels. And the very first result was already surprising. We have 17 angstrom capillaries using five layer graphene in spaces. I think there were about 100 channels in parallel. And what we have found that uh, a flow rate of helium very much depends whether we use molybdenum disulfide as walls of the channel or graphite or HBN as uh, capillary walls. So uh, notice the scale here. So molybdenum disulfide capillaries are 100 times less conductive with respect to helium than graphite or boron nitride channels. What? Probably not a big surprise, okay, something different. But what is really surprising, if you compare with uh, what you expect, from classical physics, nuts and flow, you'll find out that molybdenum disulfide shows what you essentially expect from uh, capillaries. Classical nuts and flow molecules go through the channel diffusively scattering. For graphite and boron nitride channels, you get 100 times enhancement. Uh, you can also make the same capillaries of different lengths from here, from molybdenum disulfide and graphite, and with a huge factor difference, as you can expect, can be different by a factor of thousand. What you find out that while nuts and flow still well explaining transport of helium through molybdenum disulfide capillaries, there is essentially no dependence for the flow of helium through graphite channels on their length. It's like whether you take very, very long channel and very, very short channel, just aperture, you observe the same flow. How do we understand this quite unusual uh, observation? Uh, Knudsen flow essentially assumes in its derivations that there is kind of diffusive scattering, atoms entering capillary, they go forward and backwards diffusively before eventually emerging 
at the other end of a long channel. If you have a very short channel, then everything which goes in goes out immediately. But another possibility, if you have specular scattering, in this case, if atom goes inside the channel, it goes deterministically into the other side of the channel. 100%, everything goes in, goes out, with a little bit time de de uh, delay, but it's like you get just an aperture, not a long channel. And this is what we believe is happening now, specular scattering of ballistic channels. So in both cases, molybdenum disulfide or graphite or boron nitride, we have atomically flat surfaces. But apparently, when we are talking about atomic scale technology, not all surfaces are equally flat. Some are flatter than others. And if you calculate the distribution of electron clouds, how dense electrons are around atoms, you see that here is graphene or graphite surface. It's atomically flat with sub-angstrom uh, accuracy. But as the same approximately is for boron nitride. But when we are talking about molybdenum disulfide, it's more the roughness, intrinsic roughness, is larger than one angstrom. And this is why there is this difference between specular scattering and diffusive scattering, which see with experiment. We can prove this experimentally, but by measuring, say, deuterium and hydrogen flow through those channels, which uh, uh, support this uh, explanation I have given you. Okay, so gases go through. Let's see whether uh, liquids go through our channels. In this case, most obvious is water. We have made made uh, a few years ago a very dedicated setup. As you see here, we can measure with microgram accuracy uh, evaporation of water from the container. Everything is in control at control temperature and outside uh, highly controlled humidity. So uh, this is schematics of what is here. It's our micro container on this balance. And when water evaporates, uh, the weight goes down. And this is what we see. We, we looked over many days how water is lost from the container because water flows from it and evaporates on the other side. In this case, we have a, a three layer graphene spaces, one nanometer channel, 200 channels in parallel. And we make channels of different lengths and see that uh, what you expect, the longer the length of the channel, the slower evaporation is. And it's a quite good reproducibility, which tells us that everything we are doing is, is uh, quite reasonable. Uh, when you talk about absolute numbers of evaporation, you immediately find out that it's extremely fast flow. If it would be kind of, you know, rough channel and so on, we wouldn't have enough accuracy to detect anything. So fortunately, uh, our accuracy is enough uh, just because the flow is extremely high. One meter per second through angstrom scale channel is, is really high. This translates into nearly frictionless flow. Sleep length, for those who know what it is, is about 100 nanometers. It essentially shows that friction coefficient is extremely low between graphite and uh, walls of those capillaries. Again, shows that very high quality. Uh, I don't want to pretend that we understand anything, everything 
about uh, those capillaries when we get um, study in chat uh, weight loss, how fast it flows versus versus uh, uh, capillary height. In this case, it's shown in the number of the space alas. It seems to be quite reasonable dependence. Uh, uh, the bigger, uh, the higher the channel, the quicker evaporation happens. This is what you expect, but then at uh, Angstrom scale, when capillaries becomes of the order of one nanometer, we see a huge enhancement before everything disappears, the flow disappears. Uh, it's hard to interpret this data because there are some unknown parameters which uh, depend on the confinement. It's, uh, you know, we're talking um, about confinement with comparable with the size of water molecules and uh, it's uh, it's you don't know how water behaves, so there is a lot of questions remain remain to be answered uh, in this in this regime. How uh, the physics happens in that? Uh, a little bit uh, better, we understand what's going with ion transport. This is the work over the last two years. In this case, we took channels which are. Uh, six, seven angstrom high using two layer graphene. Only those channels to limit our parameter space, which we can explore. And why, why this channel? Why not bigger channels? For a simple reason, because ions usually travel covered with a coat of water molecules, so no hydrating. Uh, hydration shelf. It's about three water molecules, and this is about for smallest salt is about seven angstrom. So we are in the regime where the size of ions, effective size of ions, is comparable with the size of our capillaries, and we studied this regime. Let me go uh, reasonably quickly through this uh, subject. First of all, we characterized our capillaries with respect to this ion transport. And uh, this is done by measuring conductance as a function of concentration. We use uh, KCL chlorine solutions and found this kind of the curves. They allowed us to say how many charges are on the walls of uh, graphite or molybdenum disulfide or any other materials. And the numbers here are exceptionally small with respect to any other known capillary, including carbon nanotubes. It's extremely small number telling that if there are charges on the walls, they're 200 angstroms apart. So charges are very rare, which again tells that these capillaries are extremely clean. Uh, we also can characterize uh, conductivity of our capillaries by using different chlorine solutions. It's all chlorine solutions, but different onions here. And depending on their diameter, we see that the larger diameter, the smaller the conductivity is. This is the bulk solution. This is our capillaries, how they behave. This is what you generally expect. Conductivity is the sum of uh, uh, mobilities given by onions and cations, uh, cations, anions and cations. And uh, uh, from this one, we can extract the sum of those mobilities. In another experiment, which is called drip diffusion experiment. It shows which uh, whether uh, positive or negative ions drip quicker. And from this kind of experiments, which I don't have time to go in, into detail, uh, we can extract the ratio of those mobilities. At the end, we, end, we extract mobility of different uh, positive ions as a function of their hydrated diameter. 
it's a rather dense graph. What is shown here, those is just the same value for chlorine uh, ions. Those blue dots is a mobility known for bulk solutions for different ions. And uh, here, the same ions under strong confinement. What you see here is that the larger the diameter, the less mobile it is within our capillary. So um, K plus is uh, practically is not influenced by the confinement, while aluminum three plus is uh, two orders of magnitude less mobile under the confinement than in the bulk solution. But it still goes through. So the news here, despite we squeeze a relatively large ball, which is iron into this capillary, it's not rejected completely. It can a little bit behave like a soft ball and go through those capillaries. Another important uh, observation that, uh, uh, for example, uh, K plus is essentially not influenced by confinement, but the same size chlorine minus is more mobile in the bulk than under the confinement. And this tells you that the difference between this situation is orientation of water molecules in different directions. So in this kind of orientation, interaction with graphite walls is weaker than in this orientation. So a lot of things remains to be understood, but uh, approximately we have no idea how, conf how uh, things happening under very strong confinement. We improved on this research quite recently by uh, making even smaller slits. I describe you by taking two layers of graphite in those uh, capillaries on the previous slides. And this is our molecular dynamic simulation show that there should be an open space. Whatever we tried in molecular dynamic situation, when we try to extract only one atomic plane, capillaries collapsed. Uh, we try to improve really, really hard, but capillaries always collapse. You see edge dislocation here, edge dislocation here. And this is because Van der Waals, uh, Van der Waals interaction is so powerful on, the, on this scale that it pushes them, uh, them closer. And what ha even if you take infinitely thick layer above, there is still enough interaction to distort uh, lattices around uh, for those capillaries collapse. Nonetheless, we have found surprisingly in our experiments, improved experiments after three years of research, that even for as when we make capillaries with single atomic plane extracted, they allow water through. And this is not uh, an artifact. This is uh, uh, the same data in this case for three different channels. We do see extremely small, but reliably see water flow through those. What's happening? Why, why theory predicts uh, that there would be no, no uh, transport, but experimentally we do see transport. We believe what's happening that initially capillaries are indeed collapsed, but when they put water around, those water molecules intercalate somewhere here and open those channels and then water can go through. And we, when we do this molecular simulation in the presence of water, we do see that the channels become so open. Intercalation of graphite, as you see in this case, happens with water molecules. Uh, this is particularly interesting to see ion transport through such capillaries because they are only 
empty space nominally about three angstroms. And this is the same as the space of aquaporins, those ionic channels in our bodies. And, uh, uh, and uh, it's interesting to see, to see uh, how artificial channels are comparable with those protein channels in our bodies. So uh, we know that water goes through. The question is whether other ions, even smallest ones, can go through. And whatever we tried, whatever salt we tried, in this case, there are only four salts, but there are actually we tried many other salts as well. We don't see any conductance at all. The channels allow water, but no, no noticeable conductivity for ions, uh, for ions in this case. This is essentially what we expect because the ion is much bigger than the channel which it's it's no longer have possibility to compress to be so flat to go through this capillary but then we surprisingly found that when you are talking about hydrochloric fluid it does go through we see the conductance and obviously because chlorine is the same in this case is hydrogen ions which go through and this is kind of understandable because uh, uh, usually um, uh, cut ions are covered with hydrogen shells and that's what makes them really big. But for the case of protons or hydrogen ions, it's not the case. Uh, hydrogen ion, ions uh, uh, travel uh, by some something called grotus mechanism they exchange uh, protons from uh, this proton goes here then here and here so this is this is kind of mechanism which explain pretty good proton conductivity of ultra pure pure water so in this case it's uh, what we see it's proton transport so what is interesting to find the absolute value of this proton transport, proton diffusion. And we found out, I don't want to go into details, we found out that uh, it's extremely slow proton transport, much slower than in bulk water. So the diffusion coefficient is 10 minus six. And this is what we believe is how water in monolayers looks like. It's kind of icy, I see arrangement, very well coordinated arrangement. If you can compare diffusion with diffusion in uh, bulk water, it's uh, uh, order of magnitude 20 times slower than in bulk water. If you take nanotubes where this research has been done as well, and so it's mostly theoretically, but also a bit of experiment, the diffusion in 1D even faster than in 3D. So it's unusual, very fast, very slow, fast diffusion. So it's not monotonic dependence from uh, as a function of dimensionality. There is a minimum in function of dimensionality. We believe this is happening because uh, water in those channels becomes like ice it's very coordinated um, whether it's real ice or whether it's uh, kind of a, um, another state of matter we don't know but this mechanism which plays role here Grotus mechanism is uh, playing role in both and it requires not only transfer of protons from one molecule to another and another it's also forces those molecules to rotate. And this rotation is very difficult to make in this kind of icy structure uh, because, because it's coordinated, uh, highly ordered proton bonding, which, which stops uh, this, uh, this transfer. Uh, my final subject uh, is a topic of the presentation now it's 
it's about something else. Um, uh, to study this something else, and we continue this work uh, intensively, is uh, important to make absolutely sure that water is inside those capillaries. To make it sure, we specially choose the top crystal, not very thick, but kind of uh, thinnish. Then interaction of the top crystal with side walls makes those top crystals sag a little bit into the capillaries, like schematically shown here. And uh, uh, we see, because it sags inside, we see that capillaries are empty, say in vacuum. So when we put water, add water inside, then what's happening as water intercalates or goes inside, it reduces this interaction with side walls. And in this case, what we observe experimentally, the top crystals becomes flat. So we use this kind of as an indicator that water is indeed inside the channels. So this is how we do our experiments. This is FM image. This is outside the capillaries, our spaces, in this case, nine nanometers thick, very thick channels. There is a top crystal, and you see it's a little bit sagged inside. And if we make a, a scan here, we see that the sagging is about okay, one, two nanometers. Then we add water and uh, as water is added we see that uh, water inside those channels indicating uh, channels are straight indicated that water was inside and then we do something else this is our background now we uh, after making this kind of uh, topography image we do capacitive measurements to see dielectric properties of this assembly. And because the top is uh, dielectric, HBN crystal, this is also HBN crystal. The bottom is graphite and the capacitance between tip and the bottom of graphite because water is a very high dielectric constant, about 80, as you know. What you see on dielectric image, a very bright red spot, which shows that here there is a large, some media, actually water with large dielectric constant. And then we do the same for different height of the channels. For macroscopic channel, 10 nanometers high, we see bright contrast water here. Then when we go to smaller channels, about 10 layers of boron nitride used as a spacer, we, all co contrast disappears, despite we are sure that water is in those channels. Using this trick I described you, we don't see any contrast. And then we go to even smaller channels and see after water was put inside, we get a negative contrast. So water gives you less dielectric susceptibility than boron nitride. Everything can be qu uh, quantified in terms of perpendicular dielectric response. And this is summary of our results. We see that from bulk values, we gradually get smaller and smaller dielectric constant, and then it saturates for capillaries of about one nanometer thick. Uh, essentially, water becomes uh, electrically dead, at least in one direction. And uh, we explain this, that water is kind of attaches uh, uh, to, to the surface of the capillary, although weakly, it's already polarized molecules and then it's not no rotating 
no rotation anymore because in perpendicular direction water is already kind of uh, uh, ferroelectric in a sense so uh, fully polarized and nothing else to polarize this is a very important observation it's have implication for many fields like um, the double layer in capacitors like uh, proteins and uh, and uh, because proteins fold in and we leave our bodies are 80 percent of water and it's uh, our bodies protein ma machines and how those proteins machines relies on properties of water and trying to understand those properties usually people assume water is isotropic media with uh, uh, bulk properties in fact when you are talking about this nanoscale is no longer uh, isotropic it loses uh, its uh, electric polarizability at least in one direction i think my time is up and uh, i finish uh, my talk with rather obvious conclusions i hope that i gave you an idea that there is a very interesting new experimental system about atomic scale design uh, of capillaries or other structures with atomically flat walls which was completely impossible i uh, really science fiction just a few years ago now we can do it quite reliably and uh, there are uh, a lot of interesting observations new phenomena uh, due to reduced dimensionality some already quantum effect we see important even at room temperature uh, in this kind of uh, new experimental system uh, so uh, this is it so the only uh, last slide remains it's the most important slide to acknowledge my collaborators in this work as you see here there are uh, uh, three uh, Indian graduates, Radhavoya, Gopi, and Ashok, uh, who were uh, yeah, uh, postdocs uh, at some stage, and uh, now they are professors, uh, uh, a full professor in Manchester, uh, assistant professor in Manchester, and uh, uh, Gopi is back to India, a professor at uh, at a university there. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, this is it. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Andre. It was uh, indeed a uh, great and wonderful presentation. So the participants have asked a number of questions. I'll pick a few questions and uh, post it to you. Uh, so the first question from uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Jonathan Bloch. Uh, is there any swelling of the capillaries between the uh, HBN and the graphene as the humidity increases or does the van der Waals forces prevent this? Um, uh, we didn't uh, study anything as a function of humidity. It's just when we expose capillaries uh, uh, to uh, let me let me share a screen um, as we expose capillaries to um, uh, uh, let me see what I show here. Um, as we expose capillaries to water, uh, somewhere uh, one water goes inside those capillaries they don't actually uh, swell uh, we see them flattening so kind of uh, hand waving explanation that there is one der Waals interaction which is quite well known between top crystals and uh, side walls it's observed by many groups uh, over many years and this is kind of makes uh, um, sagging uh, uh, top crystal sag whether it's single layer 
ma- multi layers of sagging always I've got water molecules somehow screen this interaction. We don't understand that, don't, uh, don't fully no molecular dynamic simulations of this subject, but this is experimental simulation, uh, uh, experimental observation, and we speculate that just when water goes inside this space, it's uh, somehow uh, screens the interaction of this crystal with this crystal. This is all what I can say. Thank you, Dr. Andrew. Uh, uh, the second question from uh, Mr. Debaji. In MOS2, how the comparison of channel length uh, with the de Broglie wavelength helps in avoiding the Knudsen transport and helps in the ballistic transport of gas flow? Uh, sorry, it's, uh, I can't. Uh, uh, I try to find. In molybdenum disulf. Ah, okay, I see yeah. this question. Yes. Uh, how the comparison of length? Um, yeah, it's it's a good question because we wondered about about this one because uh, this is why we uh, use uh, deuterium and uh, hydrogen in our experiments and we compared um, uh, the flow of uh, of uh, um, hydrogen and deuterium to prove that uh, the broil wavelength does contribute uh, differently. So, for example, if you take molybdenum disulfide channels and uh, put deuterium inside, uh, uh, then you see uh, we don't have enough accuracy for, for this one. But, for, for example, for graphite channels, you can really see that uh, deuterium goes slower than hydrogen, and we attribute this that the broil wavelength, which is of the order of half angstrom, if I remember correctly, uh, is shorter. Therefore, like light, when light uh, shines on the surface, it's uh, reflex specular uh, if it's a long wavelength and uh, uh, more diffusive if it's a short wavelength. So we do see this De Broglie wave contribution for uh, uh, graphite and HBN channel indeed. So uh, half angstrom uh, De Broglie waves for hydrogen a little bit uh, shorter, uh, square root of two for deuterium. And uh, yeah, that's our proof that uh, uh, surface roughness is important. Thank you. Uh, the other question, uh... Does phosphorin also favors capillary flow? Uh, What's your view on this? It's I think it's posted by Jamal Khan. If you can, I think you can scroll down and see. Uh, does, uh, say it again. Does phosphorin? Phosphorin also favors capillary flow. What's your view? Uh, yeah, I'm aware about phosphorin. We work with phosphorin, uh, with phosphorin in. Uh, Previously, unfortunately, uh, phosphorin or black phosphorus are not stable under ambient conditions and they're not really stable in water, at least in the presence of light. So we can't use it. Surfaces is uh, destructed. Uh, uh, we, we, if you put phosphorin in water under ambient condition, it disappears. So. We, didn't, we can't use it. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, yeah, okay. one more question from, uh, again, uh, Jonathan Blood. Are the hydrated graphite layer surfaces uniformly hydrated, or does the orientation of the water molecule interact differently with each salt ion, causing dehydration of the hydrated salt to facilitate transport through the capillary? Uh, uh... To be honest, I uh, 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 this is question if ions have oriented uh, shells. Uh, what I I meant uh, 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 honestly, we don't know. Uh, 
that's uh, an honest answer. It's all speculation. Uh, hydration shells, as I let me see whether there's an image somewhere here. Uh, uh, um, how do I do that? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, on this image, uh, this is our. Uh, cartoon what's going on. The orientation of hydration shells is different. So this what we believe uh, because interaction of oxygen is stronger with uh, with uh, graphite is known theoretically. This is what we believe why chlorine moves uh, slowly because its hydration shelf is more interacting but hydrogen uh, is uh, moving less, uh, is a kind of uh, uh, different situation, less interacting, why it's not, it's moving easier uh, through the surfaces, but when the channels become really thinner, twice thinner, even, even, uh, uh, even uh, K plus cannot move through those channels, but to be honest, it's all the cartoons, this requires better uh, quantitative explanation. Even molecular dynamic situ simulations are not very good uh, for this kind of atomic scale physics, all I can say. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, so one question, uh, one, one, one more question. In atomic layer channels, is water in crystalline state, that is ice? Yeah, posted by Dr. Gargi Rena. Uh, is water in what state? I, icy state? What? I, I, I didn't get it. Can you repeat it, please? Yeah. In atomic layer channels, is water in crystalline state? Crystalline state, that is ice. Um, um, I don't think so. Uh, although I have shown you images uh, like, uh, like, where, like this one, uh, which is molecular dynamic simulation of this image. It's kind of uh, it's kind of uh, uh, crystalline structure, but what's uh, but it's not uh, uh, real crystal because uh, if you make a, a movie, uh, then you find out that uh, this structure is shaky. Those atoms rotate and the, the structure uh, changes. For example, here there is slant, uh, the rhomboid is slanted in this direction, here in another direction. So it's very shaky. Um, uh, it's a still controversial subject. But it looks like under pressure, uh, this structure is stabilized but uh, high pressure kind of uh, thousand bars, but in uh, uh, under normal conditions, so like in our capillaries, it's probably just, uh, I, I, it's, it's kind of a mixed state between, between, uh, between um, liquid and, uh, Ice. It's highly oriented liquid, I would say. I don't know how to characterize this state, even in molecular dynamic simulation. Experimentally, it requires to see what, what it is. We, don't, we, we essentially don't know uh, beyond what I told you. Thank you. Uh, one last question for the session. Is there, a, is there a relation between the charge of the ions and the facilities of the transport through graphite? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, uh, generally uh, there is a, a clear, a clear correlation, uh, which is uh, let me see, it's here. A clear correlation, as you see uh, here, uh, uh, cations with a single charge, with a double charge, with a triple charge. Everything goes. Uh, gradually as uh, as uh, um, as the charge increases so yes uh, uh, 
uh, there is a correlation. We didn't study or get kind of more. This is this uh, uh, whatever eight uh, annoyance is all what we studied at the moment, but there is clear correlation. And essentially, this is what you expect from the model I, I just described because hydration shelf, uh, uh, the size of hydration shelf depends on the charge. The smaller the charge, the smaller hydration shell. So, uh, but even as you see, not only charge, charge is the dominant factor, but even for the same charge, you already start seeing that the size also matters of hydration shell. So uh, thank you, Dr. Andrew Gim. Uh, it was a, we have come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you once again for uh, such an inspiring and interesting uh, talk and uh, all the participants uh, uh, have enjoyed your talk. So thank you on behalf of uh, Center for Nanotechnology Research, Valur Institute of Technology India. Uh, thank you once again now uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, giving us an interesting talk. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah my pleasure. Thank you. Bye.